So let's look at the Z-transform and its region of convergence. And here's the equation for the Z-transform. It takes a discrete time signal, Xn, which is in discrete time and only exists at integer values of n, and it transforms it into the Z domain. And Z has the form R times e to the j omega. And let's just uh, think about this just for a minute. Uh, it's a special case when R equals 1. If R equaled 1, then z would be e to the j omega. And if that's the case, then we simply have the Fourier transform equation. But let's put this z into this equation and we'll just notice uh, some other property and how the two things relate. So then uh, x of z equals the summation of n equals negative infinity to infinity of xn uh, times, and we're putting this in here now, so we've got r to the minus n, times e to the minus j omega n. And if we put brackets around here, what we can see is, is that this is the Fourier transform of the term in the brackets. So this equals the discrete time Fourier transform of this function here, xn, multiplied by 1 divided by r to the n. Okay, so uh, if you have a function and you multiply it by 1 on r to the n, uh, then you take the Fourier transform, then you're doing the same thing as taking the z-transform. And this is an important uh, concept. So let's think about what happens if we have a, a very basic uh, single frequency function, and we're going to take, uh, let's think about actually just simply taking the Fourier transform. So here's cos omega 1 n, it's at a particular frequency, omega 1, it's a discrete time signal, it only exists at values of n which are integers. And it has a Fourier transform, which uh, let's think about that, so this has a single frequency component here, uh, and so there's going to be a delta function at omega 1 and a delta function at minus omega 1, and we also know that the basis functions in discrete time repeat every 2 pi. So there's also a delta function at 2 pi minus omega 1 and 2 pi plus omega 1, and the same thing at negative 2 pi, and of course the same thing at 4 pi and 6 pi and so on. So this is the Fourier transform of this function here. Now what, how does that relate to the Z transform? Well, let's plot the Z plane. Now here's the plotting the Z plane. This is important for the region of convergence later uh, as well. So here's the real part of Z and the imaginary part of Z. And let's think about what happens when R equals 1. So this is an example here. We, we're going to do the, look at the Fourier transform when R equals 1. Okay, so what do we have here? R equals 1. So Z equals e to the j omega. Okay, and we know that e to the j omega is uh, cos of omega, and that's the real part, plus j sine of omega. So this equals r cos of omega plus j r sine of omega. And if r equals 1, then it's just cos omega plus j sine of omega. So this, is, this maps out a circle on the z plane, a circle of radius 1. And if omega equals 0, then sine of omega is 0, so it's only real, and its cos of 0 is 1, and if r equals 1, then we're at this point here. So when omega equals 0, we're at this point. And as omega increases, cos of omega decreases at the start, and sine of omega increases, that means we're moving this way and that way, and that's moving around this circle. Okay, so this is r equals 1, r equals 1, and we're moving around this circle in the Z plane. Now let's look at what happened to our Fourier transform. Where does that exist? Well, when omega equals zero, we're at the middle of this plot, and we're at this point on the Z plane. And as we increase omega over here in our Fourier transform, we are moving in our Z plane around this circle. So at the point where omega equals omega one, so when omega equals omega 1, this point here, this is e to the j omega 1. And above here, so this is the z plane, what we're doing is we're taking this Fourier transform, we're flipping it vertically, and then you can see now that it wraps around this circle. 
So it, it goes from, we've drawn it this way in the horizontal, but we flip it up vertically and we wrap it around the circle. Starting at the origin, moving along here, is the same as starting at the origin, moving along here. And above the point where you get with e to the j omega 1, above that, coming out of the page, is this delta function here. And then as we keep rotating further around, we keep increasing up omega here, we go around this circle as we keep increasing up here, and we get close to 2 pi, which is almost fully around the circle, and we get to 2 pi minus omega 1, and that's this point here. And this is exactly, because it's on a circle, exactly you can see that the basis functions do in fact repeat. So e to the minus j omega 1 is the same as e to the 2 pi minus omega 1 uh, times j. So as we move out from this origin here, we move around in this direction if we're going positive omega and, and coming into, if we're thinking of the Fourier transform, it lives on this circle and it's zero until we get to here for this cos wave where there's a delta function coming out of the page, zero as we continue around here until we get here where there's another delta function, zero until we get here which is this delta function again and the delta function repeats because it's on the circle. And if we're going into negative omega it just means we're simply going around the other direction around this circle. So the Z transform when R equals 1 is on the unit circle and that is where the Fourier transform exists. Now for the Fourier transform to exist for a function uh, it must have finite energy and so signals that don't continue to expand they have finite energy and we can plot a they do have a Fourier transform but some signals don't have a Fourier transform. Now for example a signal which may have positive feedback, maybe a microphone held too close to a speaker, so what's coming out of the speaker is then into the microphone amplified again and continues to get amplified, the common uh, sort of um, uh, positive feedback making uh, screeching noises at, uh, in, in microphone and speaker systems. If you have a signal that increases with time and continues to increase, then this signal does not have finite energy, it will not have a Fourier transform. But, and this is where we come back to the z-transform, if you multiply it by another function, especially one that looks like this, which as n increases, if r is positive, as n increases, this gets smaller and smaller, so you're multiplying by something smaller and smaller, then the result can have a Fourier transform, if you pick r to be big enough. So for a certain value of r, uh, it reduces at a certain rate. Uh, this is the 1 on r to the n function. And if we multiply our signal, if this was our signal instead, if this was xn here, and it's one that increases and so it does not have a Fourier transform, if we multiply it by 1 on r to the n, if the increase of our signal is less than the decrease from the 1 on r to the n, then the overall effect of multiplying them together will give you a signal which has finite energy. And that then we can plot on the uh, Z plane. And of course, that would be for a positive value of R and, and a value of R, in fact, bigger than one. Okay, so where are they? They are out here. So it could be for a circle, if you're gonna multiply this by a particular value of R, well, this would be out here creating a circle which is, if r is bigger than 1, then it's a, it is this waveform that decreases like this, and then it, you get a function that lives on that circle. So this would be, say, for r1, it might look like this. So on this circle here, which is r1, uh, you'll have a circle, and when you've multiplied by 1 on rn, you take the Fourier transform, and it, that function lives on this circle. If we took a different value of r, perhaps a bigger value of r, 1 on r to the 2 that comes down more, even more quickly, so this is a more quickly decreasing function than this one, 1 on r2 to the n, then r2 is out here, and then there's a, if you multiply by that value of r, then multiply by that and then take the Fourier transform, then you get a function that lives on this circle an even bigger circle. And so for every different value of r, 
you get a different size circle. And then you take the Fourier transform and it's the Fourier transform of that resultant signal which plots and lives on that size circle. So that's all the Z transform is. It's take your, take your function, multiply by 1 on R to the N, and then take the normal Fourier transform. So then, and in the Z place, what that space, what that means is you're living on a bigger and bigger circle as R gets bigger. For different values of R that are bigger, you'll be out here. Of course, there'll be one of these for all the different values of R in between. There's a continuum of R. And what we find is, of course, that some values of R will, be, will decrease fast enough to overcome the increase in whichever signal it is you're interested in, and some won't. And this gives us the concept of the region of convergence. So let's say, for example, in the ones that I've shown here, let's say it was the case that this increase here was exactly the same rate as this decrease. If that was the case, then this would certainly also work because this decrease is faster, so it would, would bring this signal down even faster. So for all the values of R bigger than R1, if R1 was the one that exactly brings it down, uh, then they would all exist. The Fourier transforms would all exist. And so you can draw a region, if this was the case, if R1 was that uh, cor if R1 corresponded to that rate which exactly cancelled the growth in your signal of interest Xn for that value of Xn, then you would be able to draw a, a region, a shader region, outside that circle for R1, and this region would be the region of convergence. So what, you, what that indicates is you know that for all values of R bigger than, in this case bigger than R1, for all values bigger than that, you are going to be able to take the Fourier transform. And why is it convergence? What it means is this infinite summation converges to a finite number. That's why it's called the region of convergence. Okay, so this is an important concept. You can then take the uh, transform. If you, if you have a signal that's unstable, that has infinite energy, what you can do is you can you can't take the Fourier transform of it, so you can't use all of that machinery, but you can take the Z transform. And what you're doing there, as just to repeat it, is you're taking the multiplying by this function, then taking the Fourier transform, then you can use all of the machinery that we know about for Fourier transforms, and in fact in this more general case Z transforms, to solve problems, and then invert back to get the time domain signals uh, that you're interested in on the way back. So that's the relationship between the Z transform and the Fourier transform, and it's very important uh, how it relates to the region of convergence. So don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more videos, and uh, click on some of the links for other related videos.